Hello. I'm here to talk about machine learning in unmanned swarm technology. A little bit about the background and some of the abstract. Drones or unmanned vehicles, they're changing their role in the military operations. They had potential, they have potential, and they have even more potential. In this presentation, I'm looking to present in particular how swarm drones can work, need to work, and do work together. And introducing the fact of visions, the associated systems, machine learning, and potentially quantum computing are needed before they can be effective as we imagine and plan for them in modern warfare and military applications. A very brief bit about myself. My name is Ian McAndrew. I'm the Dean of Doctoral Programs at Capital Technology University. Here are the principal doctoral degrees that we actually run. We research in these areas and we have many researchers. I'm involved in a lot of the research that goes on and support some of this. Now, in particular, let me introduce the university and about some of the background. This is the campus. It's a 1980s building. If you look, there are two parts, and in the middle, there is a glass walkway. Before the glass walkway, you can see there's some large radiuses on the building. Now, this is indicative of the time period that we had. It was in the height of the Cold War. Ronald Reagan was the president, and who was still Brezhnev in power. Now, why do the radiuses? Why this history? Well, the radiuses were there because if there was a missile attack, it would divert and distribute the blast radius and hopefully minimize any damage to the building itself. The glass walkway, if one of the sections was hit, that would explode and be a sacrifice in terms of the energy to protect the others. But we think, what is going on here? Why are we thinking about this when we're talking about a university? Well, Capitol is just a little way north of Washington, D.C., and you can see on the map on the left if you're not familiar. On the right, the university is highlighted with a little orange dot. Now, around this area here, in this particular part of northern D.C. suburbs, we are surrounded by Fort Meade, NASA Goddard, NSA, CIA, FBI, Homeland Security, and many of the important agencies that protect the nation and its people. We have people who are working in leading edge areas of all aspects of cyber, artificial intelligence, military design, Department of Defense. And this is where a lot of our research ideas come from, research students and indeed researchers themselves. And what I am here today is to present and summarize some of this research and relate it to drones and swarm technology and where we are, where we need to be, and perhaps where we should be. Now, I took this from a film quite a few years ago, for some of you may remember it, called The Fifth Element. We had Bruce Willis in his taxi being chased by the police. Now, in the 1990s, this was as far in the future as you could possibly think. Flying cars going around the world at multi-levels and in smart cities with all this type of thing. Facial recognition cameras, detection systems. It was just far-fetched. But now, a few years on, maybe it's not as far away as possible. We already hear about smart cities. We hear about potentially drones, unmanned cars. We're talking about UAV cars and taxis. This is near the possible rather than the impossible now. And what has happened and where we are? And what is going to give us this sort of trajectory to the future? Let us remember, what is unmanned? Well, Unmanned, as we say, commercial, military, search and rescue, humanitarian, research, domestic, etc. Here we're going to focus on the military aspects and think about those aspects and what is there and what is not there. Drones of all types have to communicate. They have to com communicate with some sort of air traffic control between each other, landing, taking off weather, weather hazards, emergencies, 
navigation. We can have remotely operated drones, self drones that control themselves, but whatever, where we are now, they need to communicate with the around them, the circumstances, and even the geography before they can be effective. Otherwise, they're not safe in their use. I want to briefly mention here, and let's think about communications. Quantum computing offers you know, immediate processing of data, analysis of weather patterns, receiving information, whether it should change different directions. And we know that quantum computing, as it becomes smaller, more affordable and practical, can process an infinite number of lines of code or information instantly or to a human instantly. But it still needs to communicate. And communication is still limited by our standard ways that we have now for aircraft, cars, radios, and everything else. What we really need in the long term is to have a quantum computing at the application and not centrally communicating with it. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, that adds to the fact that what we're dealing with is the face that we need to change communication because communication is important. Limiting it is even more important in situations, but how do we do that? We're going back 10 years now. This was me playing with some games and different things in the middle of Nevada. And you can see there's an unmanned system or drone, and that is operated by remote with satellites and other communications and flying over Afghanistan. That was possible technician technology 10 years ago. People need to be trained to do this. And here we are in a system training people for that. The remote drones may take off locally. They have a low power requirement and the fuel in them and can operate for 24 hours, even longer now, at 30, 40, 60,000 feet. And they are remotely controlled, again, with a human interface and all the implications. The difference here is that there's a time lag between the communication. Let's move forward eight years. Here we have a classic or ubiquitous F-16 jet. If you look at it, look closer, and you might first of all think that the pilot's dropped his iPhone and is going to pick it up. But there's no pilot. This is remotely controlled from somewhere in Florida as it flies over the Gulf of Mexico and other areas there. We're not flying drones now, we're flying real fighter jets that could be weaponized and could be used. This is where we have been and this is where we are now. This is current technology. And this was a very recent one that was done. This was done in the Middle East and you can see there's lots of little drones and they're communicating with each other or pre-programmed as we would say. And they go through an algorithm and they move around and they simulate with lights on the human being. If four or five of them broke, if two of them collided into each other, if the battery broke or something like this, then we wouldn't have such a spectacular situation as we see here. These have been programmed and operating on a system. It's not drones walking. It's an individual drone operated and moving around. But how do we move this forward? And this is one of the challenges that we face. Now, what is holding us back? And there are many things down here, but in particular, identification of a target. Now, in the military, or collateral damage is not very good. It's the sort of thing where the CNN film crew are there, and they're looking at things, and this is embarrassing for whenever it happens. Ident identification of targets is something very important to deal with. Now, I've got a map here, and it's of Europe. And we can see there are various zones. And if we start with D, we can see that you can fly around in a large area in Spain and never leave the actual country or the communications. But if we look at A, B, and C, we can see there are a mixture of countries and languages. And just in A, we have France, Luxembourg, Belgium, Netherlands, and Germany, all with different languages. Now, this communication is a problem in terms of what we're dealing with. And we're familiar that the, the Chicago Convention of 1944 stipulated English as the main language in aviation. 
If we don't have human interfaces, this is removed totally. If we don't have interfaces, there's no language situations entering other airspaces, landing, taking off and dealing with things. And these are areas that we need to be concentrating on. Now, how are we doing this? Well, there is the next generation of air traffic control with satellites and all systems, which is being rolled out across America, then Europe and the rest of the world to effectively use airspace as it becomes more populated. These things we'll be dealing with and they will be communicating. And it's technology that is already here. It is possible to implement unmanned systems in commercial airspace with military planes as well or anything else and make sure that they are safe, organized and they do not collide. But things can go wrong and things do go wrong. And we always have this situation because whenever we have any communications, communicating outside of that ecosystem, there are a risk of cyber attacks. Cyber attacks are all levels. And here's a, a sort of a headline. A new tech aims to tell pilots when their planes has been hacked. Well, that's not very good. That's worrying. Some of these planes could have some very serious weapons on them. And we're now saying instead of stopping it, we're trying to inform the pilot they could have been hacked. That is not always a solution that we want. And what I have here is a little bit of a joke in terms of, you know, and think about it and go back to that slide with the fifth protocol, fifth element. You know, we buy something for the home and it will need a firewall. Now, that has to be considered and that has to be included as it does with any communications that we're dealing with. Now, in America, we have critical infrastructure sectors and the government has specified these. The health is perhaps one which is attacked more than anyone else with lots of information. It tends to have a lower level of cybersecurity than some of the others. But imagine hacking these things and the implications that it has. They're all clever people. And we think we can spot a hack or trick or an email where we shouldn't click. But just look at this, BMW. One of these is correct. One of them's not. If you had to say now, you'd probably say it with confidence. If it was on a game show for a million dollars, you might not be so confident. If you were tired, if you were stressed, if you were in a war zone, you might make that human error. And these are the things that need to be addressed and a part of what we need for new technology. Aviation has gone through a lot of development in, since the 1960s with the type of communication series, parallel, and how we communicate but they're all relatively slow and old technology. And there are all a risk. And there are risks because we may have a blind spot where we're flying or the system may go down. There may be a satellite problem, a communication problem. And under the ICAO in the United Nations, there are standards to be able to communicate. These standards need to be robust and need to be updated. And not all of them are that as confident as we should be in them. Let's think now about the problems with identification of targets. If we look at the one on the left, we can clearly recognize what appears to be probably a father, a mother, and a child. We don't know if that's a family, a unit, whether it's a teacher and a friend, or any other combination like that. We identify the child as the shortest. And just to highlight the conflict, on the right, I put another picture where we would identify the child as the shortest, but in this case, that is not so. Sensors, identifying targets, analyzing that information is very critical. We do not have enough sensors. We do not have enough remote processing power at speeds to be able to do that. And for drones in a swarm to work effectively, these are areas of research that we are pursuing and we need questions to be answered. Now, when it comes to artificial intelligence, people use this phrase as, oh, we'll use artificial intelligence. That will solve it. But will it? Artificial intelligence can only act on the information it's got. If our sensors and information are not as good, if it's hacked, if there's a cyber attack, are we sure what's happening? There are always opposition military using ways of confusing the enemy. And drones and swarm drones are no different. 
even without them being effective, there are systems to try to counter them. And if we look at artificial intelligence is part of a solution, not a solution. Robotic wars and types of robotics are changing as we have different types of processing, speed, integration, and systems. We need drones that can work together if they're going to be an effective sort of defense mechanism for any type of military. And as I said, we have anti-drone solutions, counter-drones, drone detections, drone jamming. We also have a ha drone hacking and anti-drone controlling. And where, without robust protection, those drones or swarms could be turned around on the actual people that were controlling them and turn them around against the people and reverse it. So where we have this possibility of a new type of technology and a new use, we also have many possibilities of problems and serious problems that again, we need to be thinking about. We need to pick the right type of unmanned systems. And nowadays we need to consider attack and surveillance and all the multi roles. Do we have specialist drones as we do with fighter aircraft and bombers, for example? Or do we have multi role systems? Do we have a system for a certain type or not? These are all decisions where there's no known answers and research is undertaken and looking to find solutions for all of these. We tend to be doing some of this in baby steps and baby steps can be effective, but not necessarily if they're done in a random order. And we try to solve solutions without identifying what are the solutions that we should be solving first of all. And again, going back to these, and I'm not going to read through all of this, but what have we been summarizing so far? And that is the threat, the counter threat, where we're going and what we're going to be doing. We need to be thinking about self-coding within them, quantum computing, which is actual localized in the drones. If you had a thousand drones go in and they know if 50 of them or 100 of them were removed or taken out or damaged and how it reprioritized them. How do you do that? How do you make sure that those decisions are made fast and correctly? And whenever they're used, they're used as intended. And these are more research questions. When it comes to drone swarms, we have more questions than we have answers. And I always think that's a fascinating, but also a dangerous situation to be in. And I'd like to slowly finish this presentation by reminding us of another wonderful film, Jurassic Park. Dr. Ian Malcolm, the mathematician who dealt with chaos theory. And when they'd seen all the dinosaurs for the very first time and everyone is excited about, oh, this is wonderful. It was Dr. Ian Malcolm in the film who said, you know, this is wrong. This is totally wrong. You're standing on the shoulder of people to actually move forward and you don't know what you're doing. And instead of asking, can we do it? We ignore asking the question if we should do it. And from this presentation, if there's one thing I'd like you to take away, this is an important thing to reflect as engineers, scientists, researchers, and all people associated with computing, technology, and everything. Just because we can do something doesn't mean to say it's right. We can do something and we ignore the implications. Those implications can be very serious. And that is something that needs to be addressed. We need to put these into a format and make sure that what we're doing when we're trying to do technology, we get it right and we take it in the stages not to cause more problems than we solve. And to conclude, the potential for unmanned is enormous. Machine learning and quantum computing has limited possibilities, but not necessarily applications now. AI is needed to be effective, but it's not the solution. It is not a panacea. Sensors need to be advanced and taken forward and be very, very effective, much better than we have now. War might be more like Terminator 2 in the future than anyone thinks. And with those thoughts, I'd like to thank you for your time and remind us that, you know, we need to consider what we're doing before we do it, because it is too important not to. Thank you.